the more we can elicit a relaxation response in the body, the more we compensate, we balance those times when we experience high stress. You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow full life balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Hi there. Welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing. Today we are talking about breathing. So the reason for this episode is that I've been getting a lot of questions on breathing. Recently, I shared the breathing series on Instagram, and it's loading up slowly but surely on Facebook as well, which introduced a number of breathing techniques that you can use to support yourself to find emotional regulation. Now, breathing is something that is incredibly important, and that's why I wanted to share the breathing series with you, but since then, so many of you have reached out with questions and wanting to learn a little bit more about this magic practice that we really, truly carry with us all the time. So this is going to be a fairly concise episode where we talk about breath. You know, this this practice that rests on the border of our conscious and unconscious. The fact of the matter is that you are breathing right now. You know, in the moment we turn our awareness to our breath, often our breath starts to shift. So that's what I mean by the fact that it rests on the border of the conscious and the unconscious. And I'm going to explain why that is important. But first to contextualize things, most of us... You know, adults living in the Western world would report that we are very stressed. This is concerning, right? Multiple times each day, our stress response is being triggered, whether it's a project due date or an uncomfortable phone conversation we have to have or navigating household responsibilities or who's going to do the pickups, who's planning meals. All of these things have wear and tear on our body, so to speak. They have a load. And what happens is if regularly our sympathetic nervous system, so the part of our autonomic nervous system that responds to a stressor, we might call it the fight or flight response or the panic response. If we have a strong response to some of these demands, we're going to increase the load on our system more and more. And if you have, for instance, a very busy day where things get off at a busy start, you know, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed so to speak and everything seems to tumble down from there it might feel like you've been in high arousal all day your sympathetic nervous system has been more permanently locked on and this is what happens when we experience chronic stress you know day in day out if we are experiencing these stressors this has a significant impact on our body So not surprisingly, in psychology, controlled breathing, teaching breathing techniques is a very common psychological strategy to support well-being because when we change our breathing pattern, we can actually change how the autonomic nervous system is responding. What I mean by that is if your breathing pattern starts to change, the rest of the autonomic nervous system comes along with it. So if you are running from a tiger, you want your heart rate to increase, to pump blood through your body. So you've got more blood rushing to your arms and your legs, to these big muscular areas of your body. So you can run like heck and get away from the tiger. Your pupils are going to start to dilate. You're going to fixate on what's ahead of you. Where's the tree? Where's the boulder that you're going to be able to hide behind? Your breathing is going to be increasing to get more oxygen into your blood so that you can keep running at your fastest rate. And the blood is going to be moving away from your digestive system because digesting lunch is not important at this point. And it's going to be moving Moving away from something called your prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain that you use when you're doing, you know, higher level problem solving or reasoning in difficult situations. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't need to do higher level thinking. You need to find that tree or that boulder that you can hide behind and just get out of the situation. 
that's your sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight or flight panic response. So those are some of the changes that happens in your body. You can't easily change the dilation of your pupils. You can't easily change how quickly your heart rate is beating. Some people would argue that that might not be possible. Other people might argue that, you know, very well practiced monks or individuals might have this capacity. But the fact of the matter is most of us do not have that skill set. What you can change is your breathing pattern. So if your breathing pattern starts to come more in line with a relaxed breathing pattern, that sends a message to your body, to this physiological system that your breathing is a part of, maybe things are okay. You know, maybe there is no tiger chasing after you. Maybe you're safe. Maybe your heart rate can slow down. Maybe your blood can start to circulate a little bit more to your digestive system so that you will be able to digest that nice meal with your family. Maybe you start to lose that tunnel vision and you can start to think a little bit more clearly and plan an appropriate response that is in alignment with your heart. So changing your breathing pattern can start to elicit what we call the relaxation response. So your parasympathetic nervous system is often called the rest and digest response. And the relaxation response is the antithesis of the stress response. It's something that is hugely important in this high stress society because the more we can elicit a relaxation response in the body, the more we compensate, we balance those times when we experience high stress. And there are a number of ways of eliciting a relaxation response, but the ones that are most commonly researched and explored are breathing patterns. So changing the different ways that you might be breathing and there's different ways to do this as well as other mindfulness activities. So if we think of your breathing when you are in a stress response, and specifically because we are creatures that have evolved, if we think of when you were running away from that tiger, how would you want to be breathing? Chances are your core, your tummy area would be locked on because you are running, right? And your breath is going to be quite short and shallow. Maybe you're going to be chest breathing. What are you doing right now? You know, if you put your hand on your belly and your chest, do you think it might be the case that in this moment, no tiger, that you might actually be breathing a bit more from your chest? Because that's actually the normal. And when I say normal, I sort of say this in air quotes because normal doesn't necessarily mean natural, but that is the normal breathing pattern of most adults today. You know, for a variety of reasons, both in terms of our emotional experiences, but as well, um, we might look at societal pressures. We start to move to this state of chest breathing. When you look at a little baby breathing, they so clearly belly breathe. Their little bellies go in and go out. And that is how we're designed to breathe when we are in a safe place. You know, we do do relaxed diaphragmatic or belly breathing. But our breathing patterns change. So if we're breathing more into our chest, we're not actually drawing that air down the same way that we would if we were in that relaxed, natural state. And if you think of how you actually physically posture when you're having a tough time, you know, if you're feeling more flat or depressed, maybe your shoulders are slumped forward and you, you know, physically feel like you're just doing little shallow breaths, just barely getting by. Or when you're anxious, you know, that feeling of your shoulders right up to your ears and doing really short, shallow breaths up in your chest as you run around from point A to point B and the mind sort of spinning out. We can learn to regulate our emotions by changing our breathing pattern. You know, and there are, there are no, no bad emotions. There are just emotional experiences we have that might not be as helpful at certain points in time. And there's different ways to relate to these experiences. But finding an effective breathing pattern is certainly one that can be helpful as we, you know, reconnect in with this part of ourselves, with this part of our experience. So we might consider 
what we call top down and bottom up approaches to regulating emotions. So top down means that we're actually thinking about something first and then kind of looking down to our physical system. So top down approaches to regulating your emotions might be strengthening your prefrontal cortex. So the front part of your brain that kind of goes offline when we're in that fight or flight response, strengthening your prefrontal cortex ability to monitor what's happening in your body so your body sensations and this is where practices like mindfulness and yoga are really helpful because you learn to connect in with this physical experience of yourself and so you can go oh wow like I'm noticing that my heart rate's going a little bit or my tummy's churning you know am I feeling a little bit more anxious am I feeling excited am I feeling overwhelmed you know what is the emotional experience I'm having and starting to learn to label it so that's top down bottom up is more about rebalancing your autonomic nervous system so the nervous system that swings you to the sympathetic the fight or flight response or the parasympathetic and if you know you might have a history where you are more aware of what's going on in your environment more hypervigilant more prone to sympathetic nervous system activation you can start to rebalance that because the more you turn on that relaxation response the more easily you will turn it on in future so again you can use breathing which is what we're talking about today you know in different movement practices or you know even touch practices like massage to start to to turn your body into a relaxation response state, which will make it more easeful in future. So since we are talking about breathing, because I think that this is something that is widely accessible and yet underused, let's talk about what I actually mean now by deep breathing or abdominal breathing. So if you do again, maybe reach down, put your hand on your belly and your hand on your chest, Is it possible for you to feel your belly extend forward and draw back? Extend forward and draw back. So controlled breathing or belly breathing has actually been found to decrease the level of cortisol in your system as well as affecting noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is a neurotransmitter in your brain. And this is really, really interesting because this shows how this whole cycle is affected. You know, when you change your breathing pattern, you change what's happening physiologically and these neurotransmitters and these hormones in your system are actually the way that this message okay I'm a bit more safe now is communicated another really important factor is how you're breathing you know whether you're breathing through your nose or your mouth you might not think much about this but we're not designed to breathe through our mouth sure if you're running away from the tiger and you're gasping for a bit more air it makes sense that you would breathe through your mouth But that is breathing through your mouth in an adverse situation. And that is another message to your system. Things are not okay. Let's fire up. Let's get away from this. Fight or flight response. Come online. When you are safe, we are designed to be breathing through our nose. And when you think about it, it makes total sense. Like your nose has a whole filtration system set up. It's got all the little nose hairs designed to filter out different particles of debris and allow you to draw nice clean air into your system. We are designed to both inhale and exhale through our nose. And in fact, nose breathing has been found to correlate with a host of physical um, as well as mental health benefits, while breathing through our mouths has been found to impact our systems quite poorly. So, you know, correlating with things like sleep apnea as well as chronic diseases. So this is a really interesting area that they're starting to research a little bit more and more now as breath becomes quite topical. So when you are practicing doing a breathing exercise like belly breathing, you might like to consider breathing in and out by way of your nose. This said, if you have a choice in the sense that 
you know, maybe it's harder for you to breathe through your nose, prioritize inhaling through your nose. Exhaling through your mouth, not such a big deal, but breathing in through your nose is really important if it is physiologically possible for you. So I'm not going to talk too much about breathing exercises specifically. I'll talk a little bit about resonant breathing or coherent breathing because I think this is really interesting. And then you can always check out that breathing series I referred to on Instagram or Facebook, um, or there's lots and lots of breathing exercises that you can find via YouTube or different meditation Um different meditation programs. I'm also putting together a handout, a little freebie that will guide you through different breathing exercises that you can get at the show notes at drcaitlin.com. And when you come to the breathing um, episode here, when you click on it, you'll be able to just download that cheat sheet so you can start your own breathing exercise practice. So the Resonant breathing or coherent breathing is something that's really, really interesting. So I just want to talk you through it because essentially what has been found is that when you synchronize your seconds of breathing, so the the duration it takes you for an inhale and an exhale, and when that synchronizes with the number of breaths per minute, this really beautiful kind of miraculous effect is found. So specifically... If you're inhaling and exhaling to about 5.5 seconds, that would have you breathing about 5.5 breaths per minute. And this duration has been found to really enhance the relaxation response in your body, your parasympathetic nervous system activity. So Interestingly enough, this, you know, five to six breaths per minute rate is something that correlates with a lot of chanting and prayer exercises in various cultures. So the Ave Maria, you know, a Catholic chant, when that's done in Latin, that takes about 5.5 5.5 or 6 seconds. So the duration to vocalize the chant as well as then the 6 seconds to inhale has it kind of working around that 5.5 6 second mark. Or the yoga mantra, Om Mane Padma Hum. Same thing. You know, the 6 seconds required to vocalize for instance Om and then to inhale for Made going through this cycle allows you to really integrate this six to five to six breaths per minute. How interesting is that? You know, this is different Native American cultures, different cultures, you know, that might come from Eastern and or Western traditions. So there is something about this resonant count that allows the blood flow to the brain to increase. And essentially what they found when they measured this at a university in Italy is that the body systems enter a state of coherence. So this is why it's called coherent breathing or resonant breathing. And it does not have to be the case that you need to be doing a chant and that it needs to have spiritual connotations. You know, there has been research done that has found getting rid of the chant and the prayer and simply doing a five to six breath per minute cycle and count is really effective in decreasing symptomatology of anxiety and depression. So essentially, the research is saying that when the length of the respirations and cycles of breath per minute have that symmetry, this is where the magic happens. And ideally, it's five to six. If that is not where you're at, start at three. So inhaling for a count of three, exhaling for a count of three, and continuing from there, building up to four and then to five. And maybe if it feels good for you, six, kind of figuring out where it sits for you. So this is really interesting when we look then at something called heart rate variation. So heart rate variation is a measure of well-being. And we know that having a high level of heart rate variability correlates with both psychological as well as physical health. So when you are inhaling, this is stimulating your sympathetic nervous system in the sense that your heart rate is increasing. When you're exhaling, you're stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system in that your heart rate is decreasing. 
So if you're inhaling and exhaling for these longer durations, there's going to be periods where your heart rate is increasing and then periods where your heart rate is decreasing. And this is meaning that in that case of, you know, five to six breaths per minute, there's going to be a reasonable amount of variation with your heart rate, which is a really good thing in terms of health. Poor coherence between your breathing rate and your heart rate is not something that's healthful for us. So we want to practice having this variability. Another hypothesis about something that affects our heart rate is our vagus nerve. So our vagus nerve is a really long nerve in our body that touches on a lot of the areas that our autonomic nervous system controls. So touching on the heart, on the lungs, on the digestive system. And it's a nerve that is associated with your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest response. And when you have a higher level of vagal tone, so meaning your vagus nerve is stronger or more effective the research suggests that you're more quickly more effectively able to move from sympathetic nervous system stimulation to parasympathetic nervous system stimulation so that basically means you know if you get cut off in traffic and you have to slam on your brakes and your heart rate goes and naturally you have a stress response because it's a scary moment you can more quickly relax and calm yourself so that would be an example of a bottom up something that's happening physically having that strong vagal tone that bottom up approach to turning back into that relaxation response and regulating your body and this is something that can be practiced we know that breathing that meditation that yoga that these practices assist in developing vagal tone but also they've found that positive affirmations you know thinking positively can actually be really effective in developing vagal tone as well so when we talked about that top down regulation you know using the prefrontal cortex you might say to yourself in that stressful situation oh i'm okay let's take a nice deep belly breath now we're through that so using your conscious control to number one sort of change your breathing pattern which has that physiological response as well as to offer you soothing which helps then soothe yourself and nourish yourself in a very deliberate manner so there's different ways that your breath integrates with various other practices and you know being connected to the yoga world myself I I was practicing breathing exercises long before I heard about them in psychology. So in yoga, breathing practices are often termed pranayama, which means breath control or life force control. If we think of prana as in yoga, it's termed this life force energy. And I think it's really fitting that we would consider our breath to be so linked to our prana, our life energy. They have a saying in yoga, you know, that your life is proportional to your number of breaths and this idea of breathing slowly breathing effectively is really really important we don't in that practice want to be increasing our breathing rate dramatically we want to be maintaining a natural breathing pattern as we move our bodies and natural breathing through one's nose so i hope that all of this information has given you some food for thought and some incentive to practice breathing you know to actually practice it because it's really useful for sure in moments of stress to use a breathing exercise to help soothe to calm but if you're practicing in moments of calmness you know when you get up each morning if you engage in a regular breathing practice that's going to start you in a state that is you know more coherent but also allowing you to really check in with how you're traveling and knowing that you'll be more effective than in future at moving from sympathetic nervous stimulation to parasympathetic nervous stimulation which takes some of the load off your body the more time we can spend in the relaxation response the better for our health So again, you can grab a freebie that has a few breathing exercises drawn out and explained for you if you head to the show notes, drcaitlin.com. Or of course, head to social media and you can check out the breathing series where I've demonstrated a number of really beautiful breathing exercises and follow along that way.
All right. I will see you next week on Wisdom for Wellbeing, and we will be back to having a wonderful interview that's actually talking about yoga and mental health. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect, find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia, or attend your local hospital ED.